black hair who, rag round his midriff and water pot in hand, stopped in mid-street, turned round, and gazed up at the balconies, windows, shops, and city stagery filled with glum activity, while a white-robed bowel singer carrying his one-string dried pumpkin guitar sat down near the cigarette stand and surveyed his new scene, just arrived in the holy city of Benares. Seeking after that sweet golden climb where the traveler's journey is done. Everyone wants to know what he was looking for when he went to India, and they ask that thinking that the answer is he was going there for enlightenment. Frankly, I think the search for enlightenment was a small part of it. Yeah. But he was also looking for drugs and boys. Uh huh. Uh, and thrills and sensations and uh, different things to eat. That's not enlightenment. Or... <laughs> <laughs> but don't raise these difficult questions. <laughs> All these sentient questions for ficus religiosus, indica's dark, green, shining leaf, and long drawn, tapering tip trembles and shimmers with just a suggestion of breath, awareness of air, change and motion before the human seated below in dark and desperate meditation becomes, quote, enlightened. I don't know if one can talk about a beat sensibility because it seems like all the, all the beats are quite different from each other, but it's, it's interesting that, that India becomes the becomes the locus compared to a lot of other places. The Beatles. Music. <laughs> um, yeah, but you started, though. Not necessarily. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Do you that. think the Beatles would have ended up in India if, if you hadn't gone? If yeah, I, I, would give it, gone? I would give it a pretty fair chance, yeah. I'm not so sure about that, really, yeah. <laughs> Conch blows from the rooftop. Monks in maroon chant, grim glance, and a boy who plays leader makes all the bows. Tara, cross-legged, head tilted, smiling, hands shaping the mudra, the giving, red body, gold body, green, a puja, a potluck for the whole Himalayan plateau. I remember, distinctly remember, one evening, two Americans, later on I knew that they were Americans, entered into the coffee shop and looking here and there and asking people our name, my name and Shakti was another poet. So when he came, he knew our name already. Within a very short time, we became friends. When I was in university in Bombay in 1962, when Ginsburg came, we all knew how. So we were incredibly mm. excited when these people started coming to India. After talking to him for, for some time, I realized that what the beat generation was doing at that time was the searching for enlightenment or for spiritual experience and things like that. I'm not interested in in those things at all. I'm a non-believer from my childhood and I didn't care about God and other things. Gary Snyder writing to Allen Ginsberg, Indian intellectuals are square, filled with patriotism and anticipation of progress, but with only vague ideas of spiritual values. So you have this class in all these countries, China and India, the middle class uh, who want to embrace the West or what they think the West has to offer to them in by way of science and democracy and all of this other stuff, Indian religion, Indian philosophy is, is seen by them as a tremendous drag. So, you know, this, this, this sort of goes on and on. It goes on even today where you have people saying we, we don't need religion in India today. We don't need philosophy or this is all, you know, a debris of the past. What an entrance. 
thousands and thousands of them, clashing cymbals, ringing bells, playing flutes, wearing bright colors and weird clothes, singing, dancing. This caravanserai of libertine celebrants who were wiping away the proprieties of caste, race, and sex by sheer stoned incomprehension. <laughs> the seduction lay in the chaos. They thought they were simple. We thought they were neon. They thought we were profound. We knew we were provincial. Everybody thought everybody else was ridiculously exotic. And everybody got it wrong. When he returned from India, he immediately started teaching me these mudras. Hari Om Namo Shivaya. Hari Om Namo Shivaya. He ta taught us all these mantras that we sang during the rest of the 60s. And also, of course, the Om. Alan at uh, the Chicago uh, police riots in 1968 overwhelmed. And he was the only great poet in the history of world culture that had omic laryngitis uh, from overwhelming. Then the real action began. The kings of rock and roll abdicated to Ravi Shankar and the Maharishi. As the sitar wiped out the split reed sacks, and mantras began fouling the crystal clarity of rock and roll lyrics. Millions of wild-eyed Americans turned their backs on all that amazing equipment and pointed at us, screaming, you guys, you've got it. So we tagged along with the Americans one more time, not because of right thought, right speech, right action, but because of the rhythm section. <laughs> Never before had the void been pursued with such optimism and such razzle-dazzle. Everyone suspected that whatever America wanted, America got. Why not Nirvana? <laughs> he went there to find everything. And I think that he came away not being enlightened but being a better human being. And if you do anything based on coming here today, read September on Jessor Road. No one talks about it very much because it was later in his life. They talk about the early poems. But that particular poem will teach you so much about humanity. Great by the well. 